Hey, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, a survival guide to the casino games industry for automation engineers. It's now my pleasure to introduce Sergio Nevis Barros as a QA technical architect with over 15 years of experience in the field of automated testing and gambling industry. Sergio has worked on automating technologies such as HTML5, Canvas, native apps and REST APIs. He has contributed to the Appian project to expand its capabilities of testing with Safari on physical iOS devices and is currently the founder and maintainer of the Angles Test Automation Dashboard open source project. Throughout his career, he custom built many frameworks based on business needs and mentored others on the best practices of building and maintaining their own framework. Without further ado, I'll turn over to you, Sergio. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Vim. Um, right, welcome everybody to today's session. Um, again, a survival guide to the casino games industry. Um, I, I figured with regards to this session, there was quite a few quirks to this, this industry and quite a few things to, to note. So it'd be good to have a, a session around this. Um, oops, apologies. Bit about myself again mentioned already, right? Um, I joined Gamesys then, which has now turned into um, well, split off from Gamesys, uh, Rockstar Gaming. Uh, worked in various industries, and um, uh, yeah, uh, one thing I did want to mention as well is I've, I've done obviously automation of web, native, backend, and PDF. PDF, just to mention, was was obviously an interesting technology to work with. Um, Originally from, you know, other than the things that Bim had already mentioned, originally from the Netherlands, uh, and I am an avid cyclist, right? You can talk to me about cycling all day, every day. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to, to discuss that. A uh, bit about Rockstar Gaming. So, uh, as mentioned, we started in 2019 uh, after splitting from Gamesys, but we've been around for much longer uh, as part of Gamesys, right? So, uh, since 2010. Uh, we're now part of a group called Anza Group, uh, which includes LiveScore, right? So I uh, don't know if you've seen the commercial with um, Ronaldo, right? Um, uh, it's, it's one of the biggest growing betting companies at the moment. So uh, we've got over 200 games, right? Uh, daily free games, slots, casino games, and instant games. And you can imagine that that is a challenge when it comes to testing, right? And, and our games as well are on, you know, quite a few websites and we integrate with those websites. Uh, and, and yeah, so we'll go through how we do our testing on that side. Um, Anza Group itself has offices across the globe. You know, I've, I've been lucky enough to travel to um, a few of those. And um, last but not least, uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, LiveScore is, is expanding quite drastically. So if anybody's looking, there's a link there with some, some roles. Okay, so the agenda for today, um, and again, the, the time-wise, it's just an estimate, but uh, we're going to cover kind of the, the differences in the casino industry customers. Yeah? Over the years, I've seen quite a few quirks. And again, it, it's something to note when you're testing casino games. So quite a good thing to be made aware of before you even look at it. Um, how to optimize your test coverage, uh, and then some practical test automation examples. Right? Um, and towards the end, hopefully we'll have some time for some, some questions, but it should be all right. Okay, so let's cover the first bit about the casino uh, industry customers. Now, the way that I wanted to start this is by covering three anecdotes, right? And, and those anecdotes kind of give you an idea of our customers, right? And, and the problems that we, we come across um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, first things first is uh, uh, the bingo wizard. Uh, now, this is again, a funny one. I've, how do you say that? Uh, I was talking to a colleague previously of mine who was developing our bingo application, and he was doing some, some investigations around other websites who had uh, a bingo application up and running, right? So uh, for those of you that don't know, you know, with regards to bingo application, you buy a card with numbers on it. The numbers are called, um, and then whoever gets a line first is the one who wins, basically, right? Um, he went to look at different websites and he found that one of the websites was actually displaying um, and say that as soon as the cards were purchased and the game had started, it would give you every ball that was going to be called yeah, in through DevTools, right? Through the back end. Uh, 
he thought, you know what, I could have some fun with this and went in the chat room and basically went and called out all the balls before they were called, right? And basically went, look, the next ball is going to be 20. And it was obviously 20 because that's what the backend had provided. And it freaked all the other customers out, right? Because they were all like, oh my God, what is happening? What does this guy know that I don't, right? Is this game rigged? Um, you know, how do you say that? How does he know all of this stuff, right? And it wasn't, right? Because there was no way for him to take advantage of it because the call was happening after you had already bought the tickets, right? And, um, you know, basically there's no way for him to take advantage of the system, but it did make the other customers wonder about what, you know, why this was occurring. So it seemed he had an advantage, even though he didn't, right? Um, similar to this would be in, in a situation where, for example, um, if you know about a roulette table, right? A roulette table is obviously where you, you, you twist the ball, it goes around, and then you put your your, your numbers down for where the ball's going to land. If for some reason, you know, as soon as the ball rolls and the player says no more bets, right? So you can't place any more bets. A person goes, oh, it's going to land on 18. And you go, what? How do you know this? Right? And it lands on 18, it's potentially because the back end, you know, exposed it early. You are going to wonder about, right, what, why did this occur? Right? What does this happen? And again, functionally, 100% correct, right? You know, th there's no way for you to actually take advantage of this, but it, 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 you know, for the players that are superstitious, it makes them think that there is a problem, right? So that was the first one. And again, you know, it's something to consider when you're looking at casino games. Yes, functionally may be correct, but can it be misconstrued as having an advantage, right? So it's something to consider. All right, the second anecdote is, uh, the, the lucky device one. Now, to, to give you some background on this, um, obviously, as part of our, our testing, um, we had uh, you know, there's, there's bigger players and there's the, the regular players. And we had quite a few bigger players that were on some of the older devices within you know, our, our previous company. And so, you know, um, marketing came up with the idea of going, do you know what? Rather than spending all this time fixing these bugs on these older devices, why don't we bring these customers in and, and promote them and, and basically give them a brand new device as a, uh, as a thank you, right? And that way we kill two birds with one stone, we keep our you know, biggest customers happy, plus you know, we basically get rid of these older devices, right? Uh, so you know, I was actually in the office and I saw a whole tray of iPads being walked past me and I was like, well, okay, fair enough. And then they brought the customers in and they gave them you know, these, these brand new iPads. And, you know, customers all happy, left the building. And at that point, you know, we were hoping like, okay, next, next month metrics, you know, let's see these old devices are gonna disappear. And they didn't, right? Because, you know, after speaking to those customers, what ended up happening was that they actually gave those devices away to their friends, family, children, and they still kept their old lucky devices. And, and this was because, that lucky device, you know, they, they won the bonus on this device. And, and that was their device that they were going to use to win more bonuses. Or, you know, and, and similar to a player that wears the same socks or has the same breakfast every morning because that's what they did when they won a championship. These players use those lucky devices to win, right? And, and that's in their head, that was the way that they won. Um, and, and again, you know, it, it's, for us, we've had quite a few um, discussions with Sauce Labs when they tried to deprecate an older version of iOS because it's like, no, our customers are still on those versions, um, you know, because that's their lucky device and have an upgrade. So again, you know, those are things I think that are very much different to other uh, industries where, you know, people are, you know, hopefully go with the latest. Okay. Uh, final one is uh, again um, we've we've how do you say that um, gone into different markets and, and one of the markets was uh, again with uh, Asia so Japan etc and you would think you know with with slot machines that everybody uses a slot machine you know the same way you know you you click a spin button you uh, potentially get into a bonus and you, you click that and the animation happens and you know 
that's it. Everybody's excited. You know, the games are, are, are happening. And then we figured out or we found out that actually that's not the way that people play, right? And, and at least in, in some of the Asian countries, they would much rather, how do you say that? They, they wanted to, uh, how do you say that? Set auto spin in the morning, um, set a lower and an upper boundary and just have as many spins as possible. Kick out the automation, yeah, or just want to spin. And, and at least in my understanding, it was more of a um, spread betting, right? Where you basically set an upper and a lower boundary and you watch the odds going up and down and then eventually, you know, when it hits a lot upper limit, you sell out or you buy out, you know, and same with the lower limit, that's it, I'm done, I'm out. And, and they would actually leave their machines and let their tests run, right? And, and so it was a completely different mindset to, you know, the, the, the people that we were used to as well that wanted a Vegas experience, right? Wanted those bells and whistles and the animations of the, the cash flowing, basically. Um, so again, it, it's interesting to see that, that there is that difference, uh, very much so. Okay, uh, right. Now that we've kind of gotten an understanding of the, uh, the, the casino customers, right? Um, and then those mobile devices, especially those lucky devices, right? The challenges, again, that we, we face are, you know, we have these 200 games. And not only do we have 200 games, these games also have, they work in different sizes, right? So. Um, the same game on an iPad will have different um, assets versus you know, on, on, on a smaller phone. And obviously, as we mentioned, you know, there is such a wide variety of devices, you know, well, assets, browsers, resolutions. So how do you ensure that you are covering, you know, you have the best coverage in mind, right? And, and again, you know, with metrics. Now, originally I had uh, metrics in here, but the whole point is to have an automated metric. Right, so in that sense, we don't have this in place at the moment. We have semi-automated metrics, but we're looking towards that in the future, right? Where uh, based on the metrics coming in, right? And then those queries coming in, our list is potentially automatic, automatically updated or new suggestions are automatically made. Right, so the examples that I'm gonna give you in the next slide, again, I apologize. Uh, some of this stuff I can expose, some of this stuff I'm unable to expose, right? So. Again, the graphs are blurred, um, but I'll try and kind of elaborate around it. Um, it's just because, you know, from a legal perspective, I was unable to share some of this stuff. Uh, two biggest metrics in the gaming industry are uh, GGR, which is gross gaming revenue, yeah, house win, or the number of actives, right? So how many people have actually placed a wager, right? So an individual. Um, and based on these two values, plus some other values, which I'll show you uh, in, in a second, we keep our uh, cross-browser list, device list up to date, right? And, and obviously that's the list of devices that we also use to run our test automation on. Um, again, right, you know, if you can have a, a very much a focused list on this is what our customer base is on and with, you know, 10 devices, I can have the same coverage that you would have with potentially, you know, uh, the next number of devices. It, it's best to figure out what the optimum number of devices is, right? Um, and in that sense, obviously, we, we use those uh, real devices, you know, the, the, the real device farm to do our testing uh, from, from Source Labs. Main reason is also our games run using WebGL. So we obviously want to determine the performance of those devices. Um, and, and I'll show you a video in a second of that. Right? That's part of the automation examples that we'll be showing. All right, so the first graph, and again, a lot is blurred out, but I will explain and, and elaborate. So. Uh, this particular uh, graph, what we've done is basically captured for every single device on every single game um, and every single website, how much wagering is happening and how many actives are on that. Okay? Uh, based on this, we can actually say, oh, for this device, yesterday we had you know, so many actives and we had so much wagering happening, right? And so much house win. That then allows us to generate, you know, this particular list, right? Um, and what you can see here is, is the color green and the color blue and the color gray would be our supported devices. And this is automated, right? So we have it in the background where we can say, okay, our supported list is this device. And then our graphs automatically update to tell us, 
okay, if this is your supported device list, you are covering X percentage of the house win, X percentage of the actives, uh, et cetera, right? And by doing this, you can easily have a conversation with your product owners or with your you know, head of business or whatever, saying, look, if you want additional coverage, yeah, for one more device or two more devices or this device, that will give you 2% more housework. Yeah? When you do not have this type of information in place, it becomes a very difficult conversation, right? And, and it becomes, you know, and, and again, you cannot continuously update this. The other problem that we had was when we didn't have this type of information in place, the perception, for example, was that, oh, this particular platform, there's a lot of customers on that. And the QAs were testing on that platform, but it turned out to be wrong, right? So their test coverage wasn't as good as it could be when you fully understand you know, on an individual basis what you should be, be covering, right? Now, the other thing I mentioned as well, this is semi-automated because I make the the changes to the device list, and this is then updated automatically with regards to the percentage of coverage. But you could easily implement some form of AI, right, to kind of do that analysis for you and say, look, it makes the recommendation of the devices that you want to cover on. Yeah. But that is again the, the next the next uh, step, basically. Okay. Now, the one thing I wanted to note here is that you can see this resolution here as well, right, which is very important to us in, in the gaming industry. The other thing you can do based on those metrics, right, the same metrics that we're collecting, this device, this website, this game, for each resolution, what is the house win that we're covering, right, and, and how many actives are on this particular resolution. In that sense, whenever we pick or remove a device, we can actually see, look, resolution-wise, what are we covering? Right? And the same thing for a particular OS version. You know, how much coverage do we have for an OS version? So when we determine that list, right, we're looking at four different arguments. Right? We're looking at, okay, how much resolution, how much of the resolution do we cover? How much of the OS versions do we cover? GGR and actives. Right? And so you can make a very um, concise decision when it comes to picking which devices you're going to run your tests on. Okay. Final metric when it comes to, to uh, this bit is, uh, again, this graph will show you for a specific game on a specific device, how many actives were there over time, right? Um, and the reason for this is, for example, we've had conversations with product owners around, right, we've got a bug on this game, on this device, um, and the team has come back and say, look, it's gonna be a week sprint, right, to fix this. And a week's effort, uh, sorry. But that game might be bringing us in, you know, on that particular device, uh, let's say 500 pounds of GGR, right? And at that point, you should be really thinking about, right, is this fix worth it, right? Should we be, you know, applying this fix or, you know, are there other bigger fish that we can go after? And when we didn't have these metrics, it was really hard to kind of explain to the product owner saying, actually, we shouldn't be fixing you know, an issue on the Galaxy S3 because we barely have any customers on this device, right? But for them, it was like, no, no, no. One of our customers is complaining. We need to fix it, right? And so again, with these type of metrics in place, you can focus your testing. But you can also focus your bug fixing, right? Because you've got all that information to be able to prove, yeah. You know, um, how do you say that? Should we fix it or shouldn't we fix it? Okay. Um, right, that, that's it with regards to the metrics. Again, feel free to ask any questions around this. I'm happy to answer later on with, um, obviously as much as I can within the, the, the limit of exposure, basically. Right, on to the, the interesting bit, at least in, in, in my head. Um, the, the five bits of test automation examples. Yeah, so um, we did get a question about how to interact with the canvas elements. So I, I put a slide in there uh, as well to kind of give that overview. Um, performance is, is quite important, right? Um, when it comes to those games, and again, I've got some, some nice videos on that one. Uh, some visual testing examples and, and a screenshot library. And um, the, the final three are more about once you've captured those test results, how quickly can you find out, you know, figure out your problems problems around flaky tests, problems around bugs, 
issues with the specific platform. Um, and even the one thing, you know, number six is the single test history, again, was something that I haven't seen in any other framework or platform, right? So let me walk you through these. Okay, so first of all, um, how to interact with the canvas. Now, again, um, there's only so much I can expose on, on this, right? Um, and, and so I'll try and explain to you as much as I can without crossing those boundaries. Um, there is at the moment, and, and we use you know, Pixie.js, but obviously you know, I think that's most commonly used. There is a DevTools Chrome plugin that you can use. And, and again, here, right here, you could see that plugin being used in DevTools and you can interact with the elements within that particular game. Now, the, this particular game, you can see that we have the logo here and there's a bunch of attributes here. What we then had and, and asked for was for the developers to expose uh, specific functions that will allow us to determine if an element was available or if an element was there and allow us to interact with that particular element, right? And now the, the main thing is uh, it included a parent element because in certain um, areas there was duplication, right? So if you had real one, real two, real three, there might be multiple multiples of those, right? So being able to do it with a parent would allow us to find that particular element. The other thing was that we needed, once we found the particular element, we needed to be able to get the current attribute, right? So um, using that, we could determine if, if an element, uh, element was, uh, you know, had the right properties or if it was enabled, disabled, et cetera. Right? And, and that allowed us to assert on specific elements within the test. Right? Um, the final method that we would need was to be able to interact or invoke specific actions on a particular element. Uh, for example, a click, right? So if I wanted to click on this logo, um, I'd be able to use the element that I found based on name and go, please invoke yeah, the element click. And we obviously created some nice wrapper um, functions around these or some nice wrapper classes around these to be able to write this in a very nice way and say, look, this game object, uh, find the real one and, and check the property of real one. Okay. Um, again, that's as much as I can expose. And, and I hope this gives um, give you some information of how to interact with, um, with those uh, games. I understand that this isn't you know, uh, similar to how a customer would interact, right? With, with regards to a, a click. Uh, I've seen other options in the past using visual testing, right? Where they find a particular logo, um, X, Y position within the screen, and then use that to click into that area. Um, it didn't always work as well, right, for us. Uh, and again, using the visual testing, which I'll, I'll go through in a second, helped us to cover the additional bits about, okay, even though the element might be there and the element attribute uh, is correct, you know, what prevents from anything from overlaying it, right? Okay, so uh, first thing, performance-wise, right? Uh, and uh, again, I'll, I'll show you two videos in a second, but for these games, the most important thing is, you know, at what frame rate are they running from a performance perspective, right? So on the newer devices, obviously, you know, they're very powerful. They're almost like mini computers, basically. So the games are fine to, to run on those. But when you start looking at some of the older devices, you know, the game that you've developed with all of these graphics and all of these animations may not run as smoothly, right? And, and how do you determine that it isn't running as smoothly, right? That it isn't, um, how do you say that? That it is struggling on one of those older devices. And, and that's where the you know, frames per second comes into to play. Now, um, the, again, the library that we're using for this is, is open source, right? You can see here the, the link, and there are a few modifications that, was, that were done um, to be able to use it in the way that we needed. Uh, one example was the exposure of the frame rate per second, right? So again, initially, it was just displaying it on the screen. Uh, from our test perspective, we wanted to be able to capture these metrics um, in an array yeah, for every test and say, look, we're starting the test, start capturing the frame rates per second. Um, the other thing is we discard the first and the last metric, right? just because obviously we're loading the game, so stuff can happen. Uh, and then we take the average, the min and the max, and we can do assertions on those. And I'll show you that in, in a second, basically. 
Um, the other thing is, you know, you can hide the panel as well, right? Um, and the final thing is you have to trigger this in the iframe that has a particular game, like the canvas. Okay, the two examples uh, I have on this is, is one of our games called um, uh, Coinburst. Now, we, I've got two examples, one on an iPhone X and one on an iPhone uh, Success. Uh, let me try and run this at the moment. I will, uh, let's see, if I maximize my screen, uh, Jim, can you let me know? Can you see this? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So what you can see here, and I'll, I'll, I'll reset it just so you see, uh, at a certain point, we're injecting this script, right? At that point, you'll see that little, uh, the, the, the little diagram start at the top. And it is very nice because it is a bar chart, right? So when we have a bug for a particular animation, right, you can actually go back and say, hey, look, you, you can see the graphics it dropping, right? So there's potentially a performance issue there. Um, it will only, you know, as I mentioned, we capture it on a per test basis, right? So we capture that array for a test and we do an average for a test because each test is probably checking, checking a particular type of functionality. Um, what I did want to show you in, in this particular example is obviously we're running on an iPhone X yeah? and you can see that the frame rate on this particular device is, is rarely dropping under 57, right? It, it's, you know, and, and in a second, um, we're going to get to an animation that will throw a whole bunch of coins, you know, and, and that's that Vegas experience that I was mentioning earlier. Right, and, and this is what people you know, at least want to see because you know, they've just won something and it gives you that feeling that yes, you know, it, I've, I've just won some money basically. Uh, there you go, there you go, there's a whole bunch of coins. You can even still see that whilst we're running this bonus test, there's not a single change in the frame rate, right? It, it's still up there, 57 is still the, the, the frame rate to beat, right? Okay, so if I then go to the Next device, uh, apologies, let me minimize this. Uh, yep, iPhone success, right. So let's try the same test with the same frame rate on an iPhone success. Uh, apologies. There you go, maximize the screen again. Let me reset it. Right, so again, it's a lower resolution device, so you'll see that it's, it's a bit more blurry than the the other one, but you should still be able to see the uh, frame rate. And you can already tell yeah, the frame rate has dropped below 42, even you know, whilst we're, we're starting, right? And the graph has started to be far more, more impacted. So it's going up and down. Um, the good thing about this particular test is, right, we can run through our test cases very quickly on all the different devices that we have. Right? So um, you know, the, the physical devices, and we can actually check, you know, for, for every game, right, whilst we run through the test, is there at any given point, does it drop below the minimum value that we expect, right? And, and assert on this. And I'll show you in a second how we do the assertion. Um, <clears throat> apologies. But in this, even, the, even in this particular example, um, once the coin starts dropping, you'll, you'll see in a second, it drops to um, 28 frames per second. And at least you know, from the conversation that we've had with, with um, uh, the, the front end guys, you know, the minimum it should go to for us, at least is anywhere between uh, 15 and 20, right? But that, that's, if it drops below that, then you know, we, we shouldn't uh, be accepting that basically because it will impact how the customer sees that game. Yeah? Um, but again, from a performance perspective, you can understand that you know, with having over 200 games, this is a quick and easy game. And there you can see it dropped below 28 for the animation. Uh, but yeah, uh, oh, let me pause this. Uh, as I mentioned, obviously quick and easy way to check the performance of your game on, on you know, a real device. Okay, the next thing is, um, again, the visual testing side of things. So I mentioned before that um, we, we, you know, rather than also just interacting with Canvas, we have a way of doing the visual testing. Um, this is a tool called um, Angos, right? So uh, it was something that was developed based on an, a dashboard that we had internally beforehand, and then we expanded upon it, right? It's an open source um, dashboard, basically. And I'll walk you through, uh, through it. 
basically what it does is, you know, because I think when you look at some of the uh, conventional, traditional visual testing, you know, they look at the DOM elements, they look at, you know, okay, exclude this banner from your visual testing, uh, has a particular X or Y attribute changed. And based on that, you know, we can also say that there's a visual difference there. Obviously the canvas doesn't lend itself to that, right? You, there, there's no DOM element that it can interact with. Um, so at the moment, obviously what we do is, you know, we, we take screenshots, right? And, and we store those with the build details with a view name and a platform name and tags. Now the tags is essential, but I'll, I'll tell you that in a second. Uh, the view and platform name, yeah, so plat or platform, sorry. Uh, platform are considered one, either is a device name or two, if it's a desktop, it'll be the platform name and the resolution combined, right? And those two unique values plus the view is how we can set the baseline and we compare the baseline with previous times that that screenshot was taken, okay? We can set ignore areas and I'll walk you through those um, in a second, as many as you, you want. Um, and then assert based on differences. Now, again, you know, I'll, I'll tell you down at the rule, uh, at the bottom, it shows you the rule. This is an 80-20 rule, so it isn't a perfect solution, but it allows us to cover quite a lot with only 20% effort, right? And the additional 20% coverage will potentially take you 80% of your resources, right? So it's, it's something to consider. Um, and, and I'll walk you through that in, in the example in a second. The canvas, right? So uh, one thing to note, when you're taking screenshot with some of the older devices, a screenshot can take anywhere between you know, three to four seconds. And if you have an animation that's happening, right? <laughs> Obviously by that time it's moved on and it, the taking of the screenshots is, is too late, right? Uh, so one of the things you can do is freeze the canvas, right? Now, uh, again, this has to be something that has to be put in place on the particular canvas, right? Within the animate uh, function to stop it, right, in its tracks, triggering by a certain event, maybe a certain JavaScript call or an event. And that allows you to take the screenshot and then tell it to continue on. Yeah. Um, if you did want to have a look at a, a, a basic example of how that screenshot works, um, again, I've, I've got it here, right? So this is a very basic example of just navigating to Google, taking a screenshot with a view, adding the relevant tags, right? Now we use, game key, yeah, um, but I'll show you that in example and in a second. And then once you've taken the screenshot, you can do a comparison, right, against the baseline. And angles will know what your baseline is based on those, uh, the view name and the platform attributes, right? And the percentage of difference is what is acceptable, right? So in this scenario, 1%. Okay. Um, I'll walk through the examples or through these slides, and then I'll walk you through the example in a second. Uh, so one thing as well that we have uh, is, a, is what is called the screenshot library. So as I mentioned, I've seen it in the past. You know, we take a lot of screenshots as part of our test runs, but then technically they're lost, right? But yes, they will be there for that individual run. So if you ever wanted to look back at that individual run, um, you can go back and you can look back at that. But why not have something similar to a library, right? Where you've got all these screenshots for all these different games on all these different platforms, and you've given them a tag. So whenever you want to search back and say, look, I want to find this particular game for this particular view, can you find that for me, right? And then see it across all the different platforms. And, and that's what we've added to, to angles, right? Is, is being able to go, okay, I want to find every single screenshot for uh, our game Play Double Bubble, on every on all the devices and it goes through and it actually tells you at this date we took a screenshot on this device for this environment this is what it looks like right? and to be honest it, it has saved us quite a lot of time right because we were able to um run all these tests overnight take screenshots and then next morning just send these to um the, you know the product owners who've, who've had some discussions one reason is our, our games have boundaries, right? And they have spacing based on whatever boundaries. So as soon as you move one of the boundaries, the spacing changes dynamically, right? To be able to check that on all the different resolutions is, is obviously something that would take weeks of manual testing, right? And going through all of these games and, and et cetera. 
by doing this, we took screenshots of all the devices and somebody was just able to go through those, that you know, screenshot library, navigate left, 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 yep. And it all looks fine on those devices, right? Or we well, actually, we did find a few issues and bugs that were raised, but you know, it's, it's an easy way to do that testing rather than having somebody manually go on those devices, right? Uh, and then yeah, the same view on, on different devices. Actually, let me go through it and I'll show you this and then we'll come back to this. So this is uh, the tool itself. Now, again, I'm running it on my local, right? And I've, I've pushed some test cases um, into this, right? But um, the good thing is you can see here, you have run a simple test uh, for these, this particular device. It tells you what device it was run on, the test itself. Um, and here you can see, yeah, that example that I mentioned, you know, we've captured the minimum and maximum FPS and we've done an assertion on it, right? That it's a greater than 15. Uh, so this test is passed, right? And we've done that for, for uh, those two devices and the various test cases that were there. Looking at the screenshots, right? So this particular uh, screenshot, for example, I can see that it was taken on this particular date for this resolution and on this particular platform, right? Uh, I have tags that were set, which is the key name, or the, the game key. And I can also link to this to see this particular screenshot on other platforms if I wanted to in that screenshot library. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, we've got a history, right? And I could do an overlay with baseline. Now, as I mentioned with that 80-20 rule, most of our games allow to do this visual testing and are easy enough to kind of compare against each other. This one is obviously one that has a lot of animation still happening in the background. Yeah? Now, in that sense, I can go, okay, let's set particular areas that we do not want to have included in our compare. Yeah? For example, uh, you're here, you're here. Oh, apologies. Yeah, and something like that. Now, again, this is obviously something that can be set by the, the QAs. Uh, what you can see here, the difference at the moment is 5.92%. If I save these ignore blocks, then it is 0.33%. Yeah? Now, in this situation, we are still covering the home button. We are still covering you know, the config button, the reels, and the spin buttons, right? And the values at the bottom. The only thing that we're ignoring is the animation. Now, in, in this particular scenario, there is quite a lot of animation happening, but in our assertion, we will still be covering you know, that 80% of the functionality, right? the core functionality. Uh, if I look at the, uh, sorry, go back to the uh, one of the other games. So Double Bubble, for example, is one of our, our other games. Yeah, In this scenario, if I look at the baseline, there is no difference, right? Other than the session time, right? And, and to be honest, 80% of our games are in this category, right? The remaining 20% of our games have these, you know, there's a game with fog running in the background, which obviously, um, you know, takes a lot more effort. Okay, uh, that's the visual comparison of things, right? And, and again, you know, there, there is the bit here to check your history, so you can go to a previous run, and, and also, you know, a side-by-side -side compare if you wanted to with the baseline. Yeah. Uh, going to this, this particular, now in here is, is obviously the screenshot binder. It's, it's technically the, the screenshot library, but this is the example I mentioned where we had taken a screenshot on various devices and we're able to just send this link yeah, for this particular view to a product owner and go like, look, this is how that particular game looks on you know, all of the devices that we run our test against. Um, and at that point they can just go and click yeah, next. Yeah, that looks fine, next. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, and, and quickly determine those ratios, right? And go, okay, yeah, wh what was this taken on, right? This was taken on a Galaxy S10. Oh, maybe something doesn't look quite right, right? And, and then they can share that screenshot and say, look, there's something not right. Um, okay, I think that's kind of the, the idea. The, the other thing is here, as I mentioned, you, know, you can go, um, you can look it up by view, but you can also go, play, uh, what was this, double bubble, yeah, and find something by uh, tag, yeah, so you can see here, this is that game, 
here's a bunch of platforms on which I ran this particular test. So if I wanted to see what it looks like on a Galaxy S8, yeah, you know, I look back and there you go. It's a Galaxy S8 screenshot that back in. It, it, it just allows us to quickly go through it. And if somebody had a question about a particular device, I don't really need to run a test again. I can actually check when was the last time we ran it. But if that was within that period of the version of the game being released, you can use that version, right? And say, look, we, we ran it yesterday. This is how it looks like. Are you happy with that? Or maybe, you know, run it again and just get a new screenshot. Uh, okay, so um, that's kind of on the screenshot side. Uh, again, if you did have any questions, I will happily answer those, um, obviously, towards the end. The other thing this allows us to do um, with regards to angles is that we capture, um, how do you say that? A lot of details when it comes to each build. Yeah, for example, here you can see this is that particular game. Uh, we actually capture the versions of the components related to that game, right? Um, and that means that at any given point, and again, this has to be customized for, for each environment, right? Uh, uh, how those versions are exposed depends on your platform and how it's been developed, right? It's something that you simply have to figure out how to look up. And then you, you know, when you run your test, there's a method in the Angles client to say, store the artifacts. And then you just give the artifact details and it will send it across to store it with the build. The good thing about doing that is um, that I can take the last three builds of my particular component and say, okay, I want to compare that, All right? Uh, apologies, well, this one seems to have been run on a, a different platform, but what you can see here is, okay, over, you know, on these particular builds run on our integration environment, these are the versions of that particular game that we tested. And if a version changes, let's say this one goes to a higher version, um, and all of a sudden you have a particular failure, you know that that failure was potentially caused by that version change. Right, and, and so it gives you a great idea to kind of go, okay, maybe this particular test started failing because you upgraded that version. Or it allows you to actually compare environments, right? So if I ran my test cases across multiple environments and I wanted to see if one environment was more stable than the other, you know, you can actually compare multiple builds in, in this way as well. Uh, one thing to note, you know, as I mentioned before, with regards to uh, flaky tests, right? So if you have a build that's randomly failing, um, you can actually take the last 10 builds, compare them, and you'll see potentially kind of a, a diagram happening here, right? If it's one particular test, then you obviously see that here. But if it's multiple tests, you'll still get an idea if it's these two or three test cases that are causing the problem, right? Uh, and then the last one, now again, I'm not, uh, uh, it's mentioned in the slides, but I'll mention it now before I go to that last slide, single test history, right? So I have not seen this in, in any other framework, right? To, to be able to actually go and say, okay, for this particular test, find me the history, right? And it will grab that single test dependent on the um, suite name and dependent on the test name, and it will show you that history, right? And, and again, I can look back at this and go like, okay, what, what is the history related to, to this particular test? Again, unfortunately, in this particular example, I've put um, the device name in the suite name, which means that I don't see the test cases from the other devices in this particular view. But if the uh, suite name and the test name were the same, then I would see that history as well. And I could see the timings, right? And, and so in this particular example, as I mentioned about comparing time, if test cases started taking very much longer, right? Uh, you have a test case that was taking a minute before, and then all of a sudden it starts jumping to two minutes or even a minute 10, and you start seeing that creeping up. You can actually see this in, in here as well, right? In this particular example. Okay. Uh, so I've mentioned about the versions of system under test. Uh, the one thing as well is, is test phase, right? So um, because it's something that can be used um, using uh, both JavaScript and Java, right? So for unit tests as well as functional tests, et cetera, you can actually say, you know, I have a, these test cases were part of the smoke test. These part, test cases were part of the regression, verification, et cetera, and add that as a test phase. And that allows you to group it based on metrics, basically. Uh, 
Uh, right, so I've already mentioned this, right? So the, the um, field matrix and the single test history, easily defined flaky tests, compare environments, compare artifacts, and compare execution times, right? So those are things that, again, have helped us in the past, right? If, if you look at, let's say, um, uh, some of the, the, the uh, build runners, right? Mostly it will be a single file that sits there, right? And there's no way to mine it for data. It's either a single HTML or it's, it's something that you just, you know, you have to go and manually go, okay, I need to grab that file from the last 10 builds and I have to go and compare it versus actually being able, to, and, and you know, mostly I've seen it where you see a trend and it's just a bar chart saying, okay, 20 tests, 10 failed, 20 tests, one failed, et cetera, right? But there's no way to compare it, or there's no way to see what versions of artifacts you ran for, uh, what environments, et cetera, right? And, and this just gives you that flexibility to kind of compare these environments and mine it for data. Uh, I think that's it, right? Yeah, awesome, awesome. Thanks, uh, thank you, Sergio, for a great no presentation. Worries. And um, yeah, we still have a few minutes left for Q&A. As a reminder, I will also enable my camera. As a reminder, you can still submit some questions through the Q&A page uh, at the bottom of your screen in your attendee control panel. Um, while we give everyone, everyone uh, here also some time to submit their questions, I wanted to start with a couple of questions uh, that we already had. Um, this one was from uh, Panagiotis. And he asked, do you run performance, your frames per second test, uh, the FPS test cases also in your CI on every test or only locally? No, we can run them. Uh, sorry, Mike's still on, right? Yeah, we can run them in our CI, right? So um, how do you say that? We, we actually, so this is a flag that's currently there, right? And, and we can say, okay, turn this on, turn this off, capture it or don't capture it. Um, and as part of our testing, our automated testing against these devices, you can do this. Um, again, the, the one thing I would say is, uh, you know, sessions on these devices do take, obviously, you know, anything with, with functional testing does tend to take longer, right? Because you have to load the game, you have to walk through the test physically, um, et cetera. So running that on 20, 30 devices, however many, right? <laughs> We, we have kind of had discussions around if, if it is part of the build pipeline, should we only be testing, let's say, um, lower end and upper end devices, and then have a separate pipeline that is then triggered to kind of run across all the devices, right? So, um, and, and again, you know, the, the question I see as well about what we're using is, is we're in GitLab, right? So, um, and, and, and yeah, it, it's easy, very easy with GitLab CI to set up these pipelines, right? Very cool. Yeah, I think that's also the question that uh, George has uh, asked uh, about the CI tool. Do you also have some, some challenges there then with, uh, with GitLab? Or was it basically just implementing it and it was running uh, uh, as expected? <laughs> does it ever? <laughs> no, no, it, 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 it yeah, never yeah, yeah. does. That, that's, I think, also why George has asked this question. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no, to be honest, uh, like with GitLab, you can obviously use your own runners as well, right? So you don't have to uh, um, use their runners, but you, you can. But no, we, we've not found any problems, right? And, and the, the thing I mentioned as well is the fact that we can find these uh, flaky tests, right? So if I go back, you know, as I said, um, let me grab one of the big ones. The double bubble, double bubble, double bubble, uh, open matrix. Um, the fact that we can just look at you know, uh, as many tests as we want, like this, and I can go, oh, quickly, okay, why did it pass previously? But here, you know, it, it failed. And, and what was the reason for failing? You know, uh, if there is a stack trace, usually the stack trace gets added here as well. It just makes that analysis a, a lot quicker, right? And, and Whereas before we had to go and click into those individual bills and, and uh, try and pull that file down and look at the report. Um, and, and, and when you have that in place, you know, you could stabilize your, your testing a lot quicker, right? Because you, you can find those problematic test cases um, by just comparing the builds quite, quite quickly and quite easily. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, with uh, frames per second as well, as I mentioned, is 
the fact that we can run it on so many devices for all of our games using our regular tests, right? It, it's, it's such an easy way because you, you just have those devices and say, okay, whilst running my test, I will simply start capturing the FPS at the beginning and yeah, and once it's finished, I'll say, okay, what's my frame rate that I have? And then we take the average, the min, the max, and just do assertions on it, right? And then oh. at that point, you can go, okay, you may have functionally passed the test, right? Because whatever you were asserting on was was fine, but if the graphic was was terrible on a on a Galaxy S five, and you still need to support that, you can raise that and say, look, guys. There's obviously a performance issue here, and then we need to look into it. Yeah, and then, then you need to use the graph again that you shown, I think, in one of the first slides where you would look yeah. at your house win, your active users, and then determine, do we really need to fix it on that Galaxy that's S5? Yeah, 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 and, and, and that's it, right? Uh, I think being able to actually go back to, because I think we all know how often product owners come in and scream, oh, there's a customer that has a bug. We need to fix it. We need to fix it now. And you go like, well, you know, maybe it is one of the you know, lower priority games. And you know, obviously maybe it's a device that's already on the way out, right? So should we be spending valuable development time and, and testing time to fix this? Or should we be focusing on you know, other things, right? And, and by having these metrics, and again, you know, it's, it's something that you know, we, we put in place, we, we were capturing um, obviously this transactional data and this tracking data, right? And we merged those two to kind of get, okay, on this device, this is how much we're, 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 we're getting basically. Um, it's, it's something that again, wasn't as easy to do, but I, I highly recommend it, right? If, if you can do this type of metrics, you should, because it makes those discussions a lot easier. No, right? no. Right? Yeah, to to totally understand. And um, we also had a question up front um, regarding testing a game and then especially with, with Pixie.js um inspecting elements you found that library what were kind of like the things that were eye openers also for you when you needed to inspect elements on on uh, on the canvas it, it, it was again right so uh, how you say that it, it's very difficult to interact with with the canvas right and and as we said as well like we created those elements or those methods that were similar to uh, Selenium, right? Find the element by name, right? Find it by parent property, get a particular attribute, and you know, trigger a specific event on it, right? And and that allowed us to to kind of do that. But even then, it's still you know, you, you've got how, how do you say that? As we said, you know, duplication. So that's why we added the parent element because if we said, oh, find this particular name, there may be duplicate elements in there. Right? Yeah. And at that point, they found the first one that they could find, clicked on it, and was like, wait, hold on, that, that wasn't what I was expecting. What did it do, right? Um, so again, we've got some nice wrapper classes around this uh, at the moment, right? some nice functions to be able to do this a, a lot easier. But this was how it originally started, right? by, by having just those simple functions exposed to be able to interact with those particular elements. Um, and then the other thing I mentioned as well was, you know, like if you invoke an event, it, it's similar to, you know, invoke an event through JavaScript when you're clicking on something, right? It, it could be something that Selenium will click on a particular X, Y spot. And when it cannot click on the element, there's a warning, right? Because look, yeah. there's, there's something overlapping it. And obviously with this particular method of interacting with the canvas, you, know, you have the same thing, right? If there's something overlapping it and you're just tricking, triggering an event on that particular component, it, it will, the event will trigger, even though the customer may not be able to because there's an error message on it, right? But this is where our visual testing um, you know, started helping because we could actually see, you know, the element is visible, there's nothing overlapping it, the screen is as, as we expect it to be. And again, it's that 80-20 rule Right, like uh, you know, the, the, that last twenty percent. If it's going to take you eighty percent of your time, eighty percent of your effort, is it worth it? Right? Will it add that value, or can that last bit simply be covered manually? Right? And and, and you know, we, we we had it in the past. For example, one was a, a four finger swipe. Uh, 
right? And, and people are like, oh, can we automate that? And it's like, well, what is the expectation, right? What do I look for when I do a four finger swipe, if it's gonna work or if it's not gonna work? You know, it's like, well, does the app crash? Does it freeze? Does it, you know, and, and somebody can manually do it within seconds, right? And, and it's yeah. a quick and easy test. So did it add value for us? No, it didn't, right? And it would have been a lot of effort to kind of automate everything. Okay, the app could crash. Okay, the app could freeze. How do I check all of this? And, and you know, whereas the functional tests that we have in place now, yes, are the same tests that we repeat every time, right? So it did have value in, in automating. And as I said, the FPS definitely had value, right? Because it was something that a person manually would have a very difficult time to look at. No, true. And, and what I really like what you're saying here is kind of like the 80-20 rule or 20-80 rule that getting back to your basics, uh, think about it, think about the risk, really important. And maybe something that not a lot of people always think about, they want to automate that four finger press, but maybe we should first get back to the basics, make sure that we have that solid test state uh, we can rely on and we get the right information out of our test cases. So uh, a really, really nice one. Um, I think we have, uh, uh, yeah, we're basically at the top of the hour at the moment. Um, so I think that's also all the time we have today for today's webinar. Um, I want to thank you again, Sergio. Um, I, personally, I really learned a lot. And what I really liked kind of like is kind of like the bingo wizard that uh, you also kind of like, you can annoy other people. <laughs> oh yeah. But it's kind of like, it's kind of like nice to know how, how your customer could be influenced also. And that was a really great insight also for me. And on behalf of Sauce Labs and our presenter, Sergio, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.